for joining us today for an evening conversation with. My name is Melina Gay and I'll be your moderator. For the first part of the event this evening, there's going to be a conversation between my amazing and fabulous guests, Mr. Peter Kwong, Ms. Tiffany Cody, and Mr. Julio Hansen. And following our conversation, you're welcome to join the conversation with a Q&A and we look forward to your questions and we will be ending promptly at 7.30. So as we begin, sit back, relax, and get comfortable. So my first guest is, or our first guest, is Mr. Peter Kwong. Now you have seen him in such major hits such as The Golden Child with Eddie Murphy. He played Tommy Tong, and he also was in Big Trouble in Little China. He's a prolific actor of stage, film, and television, and also happens to be on the Board of Governors for the Film and Television Academy. May I introduce to you Mr. Peter Kwong. Our second guest is Mr. Julio Hansen. Now Julio is an educator and an activist. Julio has gotten his advanced doctoral degree, and I'm going to let Julio give you all of the letters behind his name because I don't want to disrespect Dr. Julio Hansen just graduated in June of this year. We are so very proud. As I said, he's an actor and an artist. And finally, we have the lovely Miss Tiffany Cody. She is an actress and she has played numerous leading roles for the Roby Theater Company. And we welcome her as a guest as well. So with that, we're gonna jump right in. We'll start with Peter. Peter, just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, I remember when I first uh, was asked to do this, I had to, they were saying, what perspective am I speaking from? Are you going to give the Asian American point of view? And I said, yes, and, uh, because all improvisationists do that, so we say yes, and. And that is because I come from a background of um, why I got into show business in the first place. Um, way back in the day, my parents are immigrants from China not China, but China. And, um, and the th they went through a lot of racial prejudice in their, in their day. And one of the things that I addressed in growing up is the overt and covert racism that I had to deal with. My parents had to deal with a lot more. And, uh, and they, what happened to them is that I don't want that to happen to anybody else. So, one of the reasons why I got into show business was to address that racial imbalance. And that is the message is the medium. And the quickest way to affect change is to affect people's point of view emotionally, psychologically. And so if they can see this face as the face of America, then we've made a huge progress. Yes, we have. Because yes, I have. still believe in the old fact, um, what we call all American uh, truth, justice, and the American way. We haven't quite gotten there yet, but we're still striving. I'm still optimistic about that. So speaking from that point of view, um, it comes more of a broad-based uh, meeting of, of all cultures, if you will, to come together and make the change. Yes, it does. That's a great perspective coming. It has to come from all cultures. And I think it's not too far along that we're going to see your face, all of our faces represented equally, because right now there is still a great divide. But I see change as coming very, very quickly. You know, one my first question to you is, you know, because of, you know, we're all experiencing COVID right now. That's why we're in this medium. Now, have you specifically being of Asian descent, have you experienced any any really severe issues of racism? And would oh, you feel comfortable in sharing it? And how you over, over how you- Oh, uh, it re recalls about three different incidences uh, going back, way back in the day, when I was growing up, going to school. Uh, I remember going out, uh, knocking on the door of, my prospective date, and she happens to be Caucasian, and I knock on the door, and uh, the door opens up for just a moment, and then the door slams shut, and behind the door I hit, hear, no daughter of mine is going out with it. no Jap. And I went, 
excuse me, sir, I, I'm Chinese. But no response came after that. So that was one of the smaller things uh, that I had to go through. But that's, that's just neither here nor there. But more recently is, uh, you, of course, the, the, the racial hatred um, that's being brought against uh, Asian Americans at this time is critical as well. Uh, there are people being uh, bullied, uh, shot, killed because they're Asian. And so that's something that we, we uh, all address uh, in, in the realm of Black Lives Matter. So does, it carries upon all our shoulders. Yes, yes, definitely. So at, coming from the, an Asian perspective, how, you know, what does Black Lives Matter mean for you? Well, I remember growing up, uh, we lived in, I went to a school that was 33% black, 33% white, and 33% Hispanic, and 1% Asian, and half those, half those Asians were farmers, because I lived uh, in Sacramento, where, <laughs> where I took prunes and tomatoes, and I was out there, uh, you know, uh, driving tractor along with some of my Japanese farmer friends who I happened to go to high school with. So race was a very big issue then because being old school, we had to go through in my junior year, uh, the death of Martin Luther King and uh, shooting of Bobby Kennedy and, and uh, things like that. So uh, we had quite the race war in our school. Um, wow. So it was quite interesting. It was quite impactful as I grew up. And I remember on election day, there was, uh, I ran for student body president and, uh, and uh, fortunately for our school to bring it together, we, we elected a uh, person of color and uh, he held our, our class together through very difficult times back then. So that was the year black power and yellow power and brown power and all that things were going on in the uh, 70s or early 70s so mm -hmm. so now do you see uh, i mean do you see a lot of similarities with what's going on now to what was happening then a lot more intense now than ever before because you know it just it's a shame that at this time i have many friends in different aspects of uh show business as well as some regular life that i have to address my friend's children and say, you know, you have to live in a different standard because when you're stopped by the police, you're going to have to deal with them on a different aspect. You know, I, I recall one time I was stopped by the police and, and uh, um, back then, maybe about 15 years ago, we had fanny packs. And so the officer knocked on the window and said, rolled it down, I rolled it down, I smile and go, what's up, you know, and he just said, driver's license. And, and so I reached for my fanny pack and then all of a sudden I heard click, click, click. And so I noticed on the corner of my eye, a point, gun pointed at me. And then I looked over at my other shoulder and I noticed that the, this person, uh, the female cop in the, in the back by the patrol off, she was in a full horse stance with her arms extended with the gun aiming towards me. And, and, and I, I was shocked because, you know, I, I wasn't raised with a sense of fear. And it, it re, re, you know, ignited the thought that, you know, things are not quite on the up and up here. So I politely and uh, obediently uh, followed the orders and, and they, they, they set me up for a, a missing taillight. So, and then I had to go fix it. But it made me realize that things are not things are not treated fairly around, so. Yeah, no, you mean to, to, you were pulled over for a missing tail light and ended up having the, a gun drawn on you and pointed at your head. Exactly, so wow. it, it, it happens to, you know, a lot more people than you, you can imagine. So it's just, uh, you know, uh, so those are things that, that we have to deal with on a daily basis, but. Uh, you know, and thank you for being transparent about that because being African, coming, you know, as an African American, we've never, ever, you could not pay me to believe that an Asian person would be, would have that experience, would be experiencing, you know, 
of police discrimination ever. So thank you for being transparent. Now, I mean, what was your thought process after that? I'm just curious to know. And have you, you know, since COVID, have you experienced any anything similar to that? Well, like different not. aspects. I mean, I remember a couple of times I was stopped by, uh, well, one time I was heading over to um, uh, Beverly Hills for a four-year consideration event, you know, one of those uh, motion picture academy events. And my date and I were stopped by the Beverly Hills police. And, and unnecessarily so, they asked us to get out of the car and sit on the curb. Again, no reason other than, you know, the, uh, I, I'm trying to remember what they said that I was stopped for again, maybe it was for a missing ta uh, a headlight or something like that. But again, nothing more than that. So it's, um, it's something that, that the police needs to be addressed and uh, re-educated. And uh, it's something that, that allows me to, at this time, to recognize the, the defunding of the police, the, at least the re-education of certain protocols to treat people as human beings. That that's, is something that's just right in the forefront. Yeah, absolutely. Can we just do that? Treat people as human beings? That, you know, that's, that's first and foremost. Now, let me switch gears a little bit. I know you are a film actor, a television actor, and you actually acted in a production of the Roby Theater Company previously. Yes, so I, I had a good blessing that, that uh, Ben Guillory uh, auditioned me for a, uh, a one-act play there, and I had the privilege of working with Ben Gerand, and he's a fine actor that I've worked with it in the past. And uh, so he's systematically executed me, but that's, that's, the, that's the show that we did. And I've had a wonderful history, uh, even going further back from the Roby Theater, working with the Inner City Cultural Center uh, back in the day. And it's just been a, a real privilege to be able to go into other cultures, not only at East West Players, but uh, different theater companies throughout Los Angeles, uh, just as an actor, not necessarily as an Asian actor or that point of view. So, okay. and, then, and then of course that the acting led into the, the TV and the film. And uh, I've been always an advocate. I started off with uh, joining the EEOC at the Screen Actors Guild and after and became a board member of Screen Actors Guild and uh, after for over 10 years. Then I went over to the TV Academy and joined the TV Academy and the Motion Picture Academy and became a governor at the TV Academy representing the Performers Peer Group. So advocacy and making change uh, and in policy is critical to our survival and our putting our voice to action is, is what's very, very important. That was going to be my next question, for, um, you know, from your perspective, what's in line for the theater, for the future of theater from your perspective and um, the impact due to the social distancing? Like, wow, that's, that's a lot in all in one question. But uh, as far as, as the theater is concerned, uh, to be more innovative, because here we are in Zoom and... Uh, you know, I noticed that as an actor, my uh, agent, the, the agency shut down. They're just, just now beginning to pop back up. I went on my first, uh, what do you call it, uh, taped audition, first time in about four months, just, uh, just the other day. And we know now that all these um, limitations are being put on us. You know, first we had to follow the COVID rules and regulations, we have to get tested, we have to go in there and then dealing with that on, we have to deal with, um, I guess, an age discrimination because they're saying, you know, uh, we're going to have to limit the, the number of seniors that are going out and I, I fall in that category. No, you do not, you don't look, you don't look at it all. Yes, I do. <laughs> but, uh, but indeed we, we have to uh, acknowledge the fact that no matter what age you are, no matter what risk factor, if you are a senior or autoimmune or whatever your, your condition is, that should not be a deterrent 
uh, to your ability to work. And so these are the things that we're going to have to look at in terms of our contracts and what we sign up to be, because that is going to possibly change the future of what we deal with in terms of getting hired uh, in the media, in film, intelligent, in stage. Yeah, it really is. So do you, you know, do you have any, anything that you want to, you know, specifically touch on before I have a little conversation with Julio? Um, if it comes to mind, I'll, you'll come back, get back to me, I'm sure. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. So, um, Mr. Dr. Julio Hansen, thank you for joining us today. Um, I wanted to, I want to give you a chance, as I shared in the introduction, that you are an artist and an activist, and you recently received your advanced degree. I do not want to disrespect Dr. Hansen, so I'm going to ask you <laughs> to share all of the letters behind your name and to share what they mean. And specifically, what really piqued my interest was that your dissertation, your thesis was on artistic activism. I love that. Can you, can you also, can you just explain what that is? Well, yeah, first of all, thank you, Melina, for, for doing this forum. And I'm so happy just, can I just say, I'm so happy to see so many beautiful people on this forum right now. I want to shout out, before I even talk about myself, because every one of you has a small, wit, a small part in me obtaining my doctorate. And, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why later on, but I want to shout out all of you there. They're, they're friends of mine, family back in Maryland. I have friends all the way from Brazil, from France, from to Argentina online. I have people that I've worked with on stage. I have people that I've sung with, I've written with and acted with. And I'm so happy just to be here right now, just to share with you my journey uh, as an artistic activist. Um, I went to Pepperdine University and I received my uh, doctoral degree in artist artistic activism. Um, and I will say that I was afraid of the word activism because I'm not necessarily an activist in the traditional what you might think of, but I am a person that likes to, that loves to act on something, right? So um, at, there's artistic and there's activism. What I was able to do in my journey as a, a doctoral student was to interview so many different people on their journeys of how they came to be where they are. Uh, in their artist, in their um, coming of age or, or whatever. And so I learned that artistic activism is not something to be afraid of, but it's something that I actually already do in many aspects of my life. And it's also something that uh, involves a love of helping other people. And so many of the people that I interviewed, I, you know, I interviewed uh, seven, 18 different people and I collaborated, I, I put all this information together from the interviews, and I realized that love is always at the basis of artistic activism. Each one of them has a love for what they do and a love for the people that they represent. The people that I interviewed were from the LGBTQ community. The people that I represented were women, or that I spoke to were women. I spoke to people of color, and I wanted to focus on people of color because Right now, we're at a time in our country that um, art is our means, again, of, of expressing ourselves and our means of fighting back what is happening in our, in our society. And so we talk about the letters behind where it's, it's really, you know, it's Julio Hansen, EDD, Educational Doctorate. You know, and I've been in education for over 25 years as a teacher as a teacher trainer, as a coach, as, um, as an assistant principal right now. I'm an assistant principal in LA Unified School District. So I've seen the education, but as an artist, I've also been able to incorporate some of my artistry in my work, right? Mm -hmm. So as a singer, I, I, I can see when students have that bug of wanting to be a singer. And I try to pull that out of that student. I can see when a kid has a dance bug and I say, well, you know, if they may not be the best behaved student in the school, but if they want to do a dance, you know, one girl came up to me, she says, 
Mr. Hansen, I, I would like to, um, to do a dance club. And this, this wasn't your typical, you know, you would think a thin girl, you would think a girl who is well put together, but this girl, she was, she was not that well put together. You know, she was, she was a little bit on the heavier side. And I said, sure, let's do that. Let's go for it. Let me let you be the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. And when she showed me what she had inside of her, I was, I was, I was blown away. You know, I, I said, this is what it's about. This is what I do. And that's what makes me most proud about what I, what I learned and what I do right now. Mm, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful that you actually have that gift because that is a gift to be able to see deeply what someone has, what their potential is, and to just have that passion to pull it out. That's, that's outstanding. Um, you touched on something that, well, you said something that I wanted to just touch on a little bit where you said you wanted to, uh, well, in your dissertation, in your thesis, you are, okay, artistic activism. Now, which side do you, you know, I, you talk about how you're an artist and you enjoy teaching and you're an activist. Which would you, side would you say that you lean more towards? Well, uh, okay, I've always been an artist, even since before I was born, right? My mm -hmm. parents were both in education. Uh, my father was a pianist, a classical pianist. My mother, uh, a classical singer. Uh, they both went to Howard University, very well studied uh, parents. Um, I, I grew up singing, I grew up dancing, I grew up acting. Uh, acting, acting was a little bit later on, but I, I wouldn't say that I'm as close to activism as I am as an artist. I definitely know that I'm an artist because I love to create. Um, activism was something that I saw in my journey as a, as a doctoral student was something that I could grab onto to, to change, to make change politically, socially, emotionally, or mentally in our society. Something that I feel that we need in our, in our communities right now, and especially people of color. We need so much, and I can tell you this from the point of view of an elementary school. I can tell you this from the point of view of community organizations that I've been involved in. Um, you know, from church, church organizations to my own fraternity thing, being service oriented to being out there in the community and seeing what we need. We need so much support because we have so many forces against us. So going back to your question of what do I feel closer to? I'm definitely an artist, right? Mm -hmm. But I just feel that my artistry has to have more purpose than just being an artist. I'm not just a singer and a songwriter or a dancer. I'm a creator, I'm a creative, I'm a mover, I'm a shaker, I'm a changer, and I want to be a, a, a model for others that come up that don't know what to do with their artistry. So I'm somewhere in the, I'm, I'm in between. You're in between. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to be somewhere in between because I don't, I don't want to say I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not Stokely yet, you know. People know <laughs> Stokely. You know, Ben, you know Stokely. <laughs> I'm not Stokely, you know, yet or, you know. Uh, but I'm Julio right now, and I'm happy where I am. I'm, I'm very comfortable. comfortable. Well, we love you as Dr. Julio. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Now, I also want to ask you one more thing. You said that being an artist and being in the entertainment industry, as we are, you know, that's the way that change is going to come about. How so? Well... One of the things that I interviewed, that I uh, resolved from the interviews was that I thought there was a, going to be a lot of um, anger, a lot of resentment, a lot of um, defeat. But I found that all of those things that I assumed would be there were not there because the people that do what they do, know why they do it, and they know what the situation is. One of the people I interviewed told me, he says, you know, the system, and I won't say the curse word, the system is messed up. <laughs> you know? And it is a messed up system, right? But it once is. you know that the system is messed up and you know what skills you have as an individual, that person told me, he said, you just got to go through it. You just got to go through, just go through it. 
you know that this is going to happen here and there. Things will happen. Things will, will try and veer you to the left and to the right of the, of the road. But when you know that you have a focus, you just stay focused on that. So change is, change is possible from in here, from us. If we come together and we work on what we do, not worry about whatever everybody else is trying to do. Because a lot of times we're trying to be, you know, we're trying to be the next, uh, I love her, but we're trying to be the next Beyonce. Beyonce's Beyonce. You know, right. we're trying to be the next uh, Barack Obama. Barack Obama's Barack Obama. We need others to come up and be models. And so change in, in, in the artistry field is so amazing right now from what I'm seeing going on right now. I see people just singing and, and dancing and creating and, and doing poetry. And that's where we're going right now in, in, in artistry. And it's, it's an amazing ride right now. It is an amazing ride. It is an amazing ride. Glad to be on this journey with you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you for, for, for inviting me on this journey, too. Oh, you're very welcome. Now, I'm going to ask you the same question as Peter. Have you experienced any, you know, undue forms of racism right now? Or even on the other side of that, any unusually you know, support, unusual support coming from people that you would not expect because of what's happening with Black Lives Matter? Uh, you know, I could tell you about that time that I was walking at UCLA when I was 18 years old and I was walking by myself um, from my campus, my campus, my university, walking down to the, to the village to get something to eat and the police just pulled me over for no reason. You know, he, he, they pull up the car next to you and they, they, they search your pockets or the, and they ask for your ID and they ask you where you're going. And it really feels invasive. It feels intrusive. And I, there, there's no feeling like it to be stopped by somebody and not explained why they're stopping you. So I cannot compare that, though, to the numerous friends of mine. They have stories that are even worse than that. Right. Stories where they've been beaten or they've been pushed up against the wall or things we even see on TV, things we see of, of, of people that, that are being manhandled um, and woman handled as well on camera. So I've experienced it, but I think the grace of God has allowed me to circumvent a lot of that. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it because it has happened. But in my life, I've met so many wonderful people of different hues, different cultures, different races, different languages, that I can't judge anybody because of what I see happen to somebody else. Because my experience mm -hmm. has been that people have loved me, and I've been able to give them love back. So, you know, I, I felt it a little bit, but that's not what I judge people on. I judge people on who you are right now with me. If, if you love me right now, then I love you back, period. That's a, you know what, if everybody felt that way and did that, oh my gosh, we'd be in such a better place. Yeah. But you know, that's why it's such a wonderful thing that you're an educator. And so I'm sure that you impart that to your students. And as they say, each one teach one, you're, t you're teaching a lot for all of us. And yeah. You know, for what you do, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And our next guest is the lovely Tiffany Cody. Hi, Tiffany. Our Tiffany Cody, she has been a leading lady in a few of Roby Theater's uh, productions. The Magnificent Dunbar, she really leaned on horns, and uh, uh, Birdland Blue. Uh, Tiffany? Yes. Welcome and take Hi, away. welcome. Hi, how's everyone? <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Why don't you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and, you know, how, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Um, well, like you said, I um, basically came to, uh, you know, the Roby, actually sought out the Roby, um, was looking for a place to study uh, with people like myself. And um, it's, it's definitely my family home. It's really nice to see um, a lot of people on this call who I've worked with and who I miss dearly. Um, Julio, the other guest speaker on the show was actually my very first scene partner. 
uh, at the Roby. So um, we all have a lot of history. And, um, you know, actually, when we were doing Birdland Blue, we were having a Q&A. And Ben um, was discussing my role. And he said something about me that kind of stuck with me, which was that um, I'm a product of, you know, the class. And I came to the class to, of course, be a better actor, be in the Roby Productions, but I came away with a couple of more skills than I, uh, than I signed up for. And it just goes to show you that when you're, when you're truly, you know, willing and, and ready to work on yourself, what's possible, uh, not to mention the people who I've been able to, to grow with and to be on this journey with. Um, to create lifelong friendships. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, Roby is a very special place. And thank you, Danny and Ben, for being the visionaries to create it. And yes. in an ironic twist, and I, I, we've talked about this before, your husband, Eddie, was my yeah. very first scene partner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I got a husband out of it, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, Roby has perks. <laughs> <laughs> right, we were we were in a Dunbar uh, hotel play together, and yep. he played a couple roles, and um, you know, yeah, the rest is history. So yeah, you you know, you you come to acting class, and you know, you you walk away with a whole lot more. So that's not too bad. <laughs> oh, that's not well. You got a bonus. Well, overall, you have to make lifelong friends. Yeah, it, it's just Roby is a is a warm, supportive, kind, caring place. A safe space. Safe space, well, absolutely. Well, now let me ask you, with the current political climate that's happening right now, you yeah. know, you've played several leading ladies, and yeah. now we, how do you feel about a woman being chosen to potentially co-lead the nation? I think it's, I think it's awesome. I think that, um, you know, one of the most important things is that, you know, life imitates art. I mean, all of us who are actors on this call or in productions, you know, we, we see casting notices that are, you know, we want a such and such type, you know, they're, they're always looking to uh, fill these roles with someone who's already um, holds, you know, an, an iconic spot or someone in pop culture um, because they're, they're trying to, to manifest that reality for their you know, individual projects. So um, having somebody on center stage, um, such as um, Kamala, and, you know, having that be the new status quo versus what it had been for so, so long opens up the minds of, of you know, not just the theater world, the film world of, of what is normal. Um, and what is what is possible? I mean, we've been in such a, a, a place where we've just had the same over and over and over again. And now it's finally starting to dismantle and people from all walks of life, men, women, diff, you know, um, Asian American, um, Indian American, people from the myriad of, of ethnicities are being represented in a way which trickles down to, to the film world, to the theater world, where people can turn on a, you know, a screen or go to a show. And, um, and it's believable if you see someone in you know, an interracial family or marriage because it mirrors what society looks like. Mm -hmm. It absolutely, yeah. it does, it does. And I don't know about you, but I've been watching, I've been watching network television a lot, I just having to like network television specifically to watch the commercials. And I've yeah. noticed more commercials are featuring people of color, which is yeah. a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's like finally we're yeah. getting to that place of equality or moving steps forward. Yeah, and they were they were kind of inching along that way, even you know, before COVID happened. Um, I was, you know looking at trends where I was seeing where uh, in particular, they wanted um, an interracial couple, like for commercials, things that were very, very specific. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of, um, you know, big theater shows in the Los Angeles community, they were doing a lot more uh, diversity and things like that, not still yet 
as successful from what I hear on Broadway. Um, I think uh, Dominique Monserrat was, was, was putting out information on her Instagram account of, you know, um, facts about how there were so very little roles being offered to um, people of color on Broadway. It, and the, the numbers were staggering. It was like, you know, in the 300 or some productions, there were like less than five. And that's astounding um, that that was the case for Broadway. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, just the, the deep seated racism, if you, it, it's just so disheartening. And we have it within, you know, it's it sometimes it's just ingrained in us. I'm going to ask you the same questions yeah. that I asked the other gentlemen. Have you experienced any really overt forms of racism, either at the hands of police or at the hands of other people? And, and any, you know, positives or negatives? especially now with what after George Floyd. What we're, well, I'll we're tell you, now. My, my experiences are actually not um, overt. They've been more subversive and, and covert. And, and I think that that is potentially even uh, more dangerous and insidious um, in some respect because it's the kind that they don't want to talk about. Um, I went to a predominantly all white school, Catholic school, and uh, very aristocratic. And it's, you know, you, 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 you get to know a lot of different type of, um, and excuse me if I offend anyone, Karens on different levels. But uh, the good thing about that is my, my parents specifically sent me to that school because they wanted me to know what it's like to go to school with people and learn with people from all different uh, walks of life. And when you're in a classroom and you're sitting next to someone who's, you know, white, Asian, Spanish, whatever, and you're all being taught the same material and you succeed and potentially even do better than them, well, that gives you a sense of confidence that there's, there's no, my, who, you know, the shell I possess as an African American or as a woman, that's, but you know, who I am, I can, you know, I'm just as smart as anyone else. But to answer your question, the, the racism that I experienced was, yeah, it wasn't as blatant as being pulled over um, by a police, but it's, you know, people not accepting when you do better than them. Um, it's okay to go to school with you and to be friends with you, but when you start surpassing people, then that's, then that's when there's a problem, um, you know, and I, and I feel that that happened a lot to Barack, um, you know, everyone talks about the American dream, but um, he wasn't really supposed to become president, you know, he wasn't really supposed to go as far as the White House, and when he did, it scared a lot of people who were given all of these, um, unwarranted entitlements for, you know, their entire life. And then they began working to try to basically uh, make sure that that never happened again and to keep um, us in a place, um, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, and the covert racism, it's, yeah. it's, it's so painful. I remember an experience when I was in high school and um, it was my senior year. And I had just gotten accepted to University of Virginia, which I didn't awesome. want to go to, but I got accepted to UVA. Mm -hmm. And I distinctly remember, because I was in the advanced placement classes and you know all of that. And um, in my class, in my class, there were only like three or four African Americans. So I was very wow. glad to get, you know, I was proud of, yeah, I, went, I got accepted to UVA. And this one girl, Kristen Kaminsky, I'm calling out Kristen Kaminsky. <laughs> Kristen Kaminsky said, oh, Melina just got into UVA because she's black. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then my friend Bridget yeah. Wallace said, no, Melina got into UVA because she has a 4.5. Right. That's why right. Melina got into UVA. And then when she told me, because Bridget got into Duke. And wow. so Bridget told me, and Bridget was African-American also. 
And I was like, why, why would she say that? And she said, she's just jealous because the only reason that she's going to um, UPenn is either UPenn or Penn State, one of the lesser one, is because right. her mother's on the board of advisors. <laughs> right, exactly. So, but that was okay. But I was, I it was a, a crime if I got accepted because I was African American, which was absolutely not the case. So, right. you know, and, we were sitting the in the same AP classes. We're sitting in the, you know, it's, it, it's, but that, that little covert stuff. And my thought was like, you know what? I wish I had known that you felt this way right. all these other years. Right. Yeah. And and that's and and it's harder to 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 prove sometimes, but you feel it. And, and you know that it's there and um, it, you know, it just, it's, it's made me want to work um, even harder. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because now that they are turning uh, their heads to diversity and giving, um, giving us more of a platform, you know, we, we have to continue to make a commitment to be excellent yes, and, and, and to just adhere to that because, um, they're going to they're gonna be watching, you know, and not that we need to prove anything to them, but we need to stand firm in being who we are and, uh, you know, not buying into just, you know, the, 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 the performance activism of the time and the people who are uh, fashioning Black Lives Matter uh, for their own, you know, benefit mm -hmm. and things like that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, everyone, I wanted to ask you, um, well, actually, uh, uh, Tiffany, as yeah. you are in, you know, really, that's the theater. From your perspective, what do you think is in line for the future of theater, especially for Roby with, with COVID and social distancing? Yeah, that's, um, <laughs> like Peter said, it's a tough, you know, it's a tough question. But like we've all mentioned, um, where there's a will, there's a way. There's, you know, there's a lot of new innovative things happening. And um, I, I can say this, even before COVID, there was a lot of new multimedia um, dimensions that were added into um, some of the theater productions that I had been to, Roby included, where people were starting to do less dressing of sets and using more technology woven in between productions. And so um, I think that in the future, you know, we can continue to capitalize off of that and, and find ways to create that, that energy that we love so much of seeing something happen live. I think that there's a lot of potential for that. Um, I think that we just have to find it. And, you know, we might come out on the other end with something better than in what we were doing uh, prior, you know? So um, I still love a stage. I want to I wanna smell the wood. I want to be in the green room. I want to walk the halls. I, I'm, you know, that's, it's like, you know, that's for me. I, I do hope that we can go back to that and still feel a theater while being socially distanced. You know, we just have to be, get creative. It's like people, who do a film, you know, I was, uh, we were, I was talking with someone and they were saying, you know, I don't necessarily want to do a film on the biggest budget because if I do a, a film on a smaller budget, that's going to stretch me to find all the ways that I can be as creative as possible. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So. Absolutely. That, that's a great perspective. Yeah. That's a really good perspective. I'm going to chew on that. Yeah. That's really good. So can do with what we have, you know, mm -hmm. and, they, and come out better because of it. Right. And really affect that, that change because as artists, this is what we do. We reflect society yes. and it's important. So I have one last question, then we're going to jump into the Q and A. And this is for Peter, Julio, Tiffany. Um, you know, we're all considered minorities in this country. You know, Tiffany, you and I are, more so because we have the female aspect of it, mm -hmm. um, but African-American, Asian, minorities. Um, I just want to know, just from the three of you, what has been your most significant bias because of ethnicity? Maybe you've already answered this, um, but your most significant and what is your hope for 
you know, your ultimate hope and goal for change that, you know, when we, because we will go through, you know, what we're, as you said before, go through it. Um, we're going to go through COVID. We're going to go through George Floyd, Black Lives Matter. We're going to continue on. Where do you see us on the other side of all of this? Peter, we want to start with you. Okay. Um, I want to reflect two things. Number one, what Dr. Hansen said earlier about uh, starting with your um, personal microcosm, if you will, starting with yourself. And I think that's when you, when you go with the ambition of trying to change the world, that's one thing. But I think you can just as effectively change the world by changing yourself. And it begins with you. Um, that is very, uh, very powerful place to be um, acknowledging, you know, sometimes you're overwhelmed with the tsunami that is hitting you of life, the slings and arrows, but at the same time, you can appreciate your own, the flip side to the tsunami is the undertow, right? Everything's yin and yang, the opposite. So, so you acknowledge that part of the microcosm with you and you can change the world. And then going right to what Tiffany said just a moment ago is that the, the love of theater is, is really transformative when you can, doing TV and film, there's a lot of compromise in that in terms of your artistry, but just to feel the vibration of the room, get the, the vibe of the audience right there, there's nothing like that uh, to be on the stage, get the impact of the, the audience, and it's not only changing your life, but you're right there instantaneously changing their lives as well. Um, these are the things that we must acknowledge the power that we have, the control that we have as individuals and uh, change the artistry. I'll give you a minor example of that is that um, several years ago when we were dealing with um, um, the Oscar So White, I was fortunate to be part of the uh, Motion Picture Academy at the time and when Chris Rock came out with those jokes with the Asians, um, a number of us members of the Motion Picture Academy were quite upset. Oh, the initiation of that was to change the Oscar so white, but at the same time, on the flip side of that, you just insulted you know, so many Asian people with not only Ali G's comments, but you know, Chris Rock's jokes as well. So we a group of us marched up to the, to the Motion Picture Academy um, office and we demanded an apology and fortunately we got it and we worked significantly to make some internal changes. And we're talking about just a small group of people making a difference and going there and ban, uh, jumping on the bandwagon of the Motion Picture Academy's a 2020 initiative, which was that is to bring to parity or doubling the amount of people of color and doubling the amount of women in the academy. And they, it was achieved in 2020 at the very beginning of this year. And we're uh, reaching out not only uh, towards women and people of color, but also globally so that the Oscars and the films that we see that affect us daily is from a global perspective and not just a U.S. perspective. It's so very important. And these are the things that individuals can do to make change. So I think that's real important to not forget about your own power. I love that. Thank you. Don't forget about your own power. Can not forget about that. Julio, same question. Yeah, you know, I, I really like what Peter said about having a global perspective. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, my, my personal experience is that my father was African-American. My mother is from Panama. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I have both best of the best of two cultures, right? Mm -hmm. The Latino culture, Spanish, food, dance, music, and the African-American culture. Greens, black eyed peas, uh, you know, grits. I have all of that, right? So um, I think it's important to have a bigger perspective of where you are and what you are, what you, what your resources are, in my in my studies, uh, you asked what our hope is for the future. In my studies, I I developed nine negotiable nine nego, nine non negotiable uh, elements 
of being an artistic activist. And the first one, and this is for all of you here, whatever you do, the first one is to realize that your work is life-saving. Someone told me uh, that I interviewed, she said, you know, this, this person came up to me and told me that he was on the verge of committing suicide until she put him in her production. He's an LGBTQ boy. She said, I didn't know that what I was doing would save his life, right? And the second thing is to realize that there's a social connection. Right now, we have about 60 people on this call, and there's a social connection just by having this conversation with people. And that's what's so valuable, right? And so the, the next thing I, I went into, the third non-negotiable was, um, what are the challenges, right? So there's a public perception that's gonna be against you or for you. It doesn't matter what that public perception is, you still need to go through it and do what you do. Number four was that no matter whether or not you were underrepresented or not, you're a woman, you're, you're um, black, Latino, you don't speak the language that well, you're, sti you're still worthy of doing what you do. You may, not, you may have an accent when you speak, you're still worthy, okay? And number five was that, is there a cost to what we do? There is a cost to what we do. But the, but the value of what you receive is so much more worth, you know, all that cost, right? Mm -hmm. So number six, what are the uh, best practices? First, just be yourself. Look inside, be yourself. And number seven, know that we are capable. You are capable of doing whatever you want to do. I've been so, during this whole COVID thing, I've written a children's book. I've written two plays. I've written a, a screen, um, a, a screenplay and two plays. I've, I've been recording music and I've been talking up the storm. I, I even created a whole new uh, organization called the Artistic Activist Collective that, uh, that I, I worked with uh, my friend Brian and my friend, Dr. Calvin Bonds, who's on, on the line now too. And they helped me put this together. And I've been so creative and just, knowing that I'm capable. And the last two, number eight and nine, start early. No matter what you think, you can't say, well, you know, I'll do it once this happens, or I'll do it when I have enough money, or I'll do it when uh, I really feel confident. That doesn't matter anymore. This is a time in COVID where it doesn't matter how confident you are. <laughs> you can do it, and you are forgiven for all the mistakes, right? But you got to have a strategy, which is number nine. Number nine is have some type of strategy. Just don't, just don't jump out there. And I'm, I'm going to put Ben on the spot as someone who's told me that. He says, you got to have a strategy. You got, you got to have something that you, you got to have something that you're looking for, right? So that strategy will propel you into success. So I thank you, Ben, for being such a wonderful leader in our theater company. And that's just what I hope, that we all here can have this connection and work together and come out of COVID better or as Dr. Calvin Bond says, being the best version of ourselves. Yes. So that's what, that's what I have there. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Tiffany, same question. That was oh, excellent. why do I have to go up with Dr. Julio? Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Peter a, and Dr. Julio had some great responses. So come on, uh, bring it home and, for uh, us, uh, Tiffany. And my plan, Elizabeth June was that we're gonna have to come up with a different name for him. We can't call him what we used to call him anymore. Dr. Julio from now on. But no, seriously, Julio, those were all uh, really, really great. And um, I want to actually, if you have that in writing, I'd love to uh, keep it close by. Um, one, of, one of the things that you mentioned um, is, is, the, uh, is the answer to your question, Melina. And um, I, as far as the significant bias, the, the significant biases I've encountered are, are always, have always been in, in a workplace for me. Um, and they amount to me being in situations where I have to um, disarm people they, that might have, um, you know, an opinion about who they think that I am. Um, then I have to, to, to navigate through that, earn their trust, and, and, and do my job all at the same time. And um, what I hope for the future is that I can you know, come into um, my workspace, my creative space, and just be who I am without having to 
go through all of the rigmarole of making other people feel comfortable or trying to dispel stereotypes that I can just come into my job and get to work. Um, that I'm not having to teach them um, and, you know, hold their hands, that they would have their own um, knowledge about um, who I am, who, who my people are, and um, I don't have to waste time doing that so that I can just simply be and exist mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm, I'm ready to work, you know, and all of that other stuff that we have to do um, to, to level the playing field is you know, is our burden that we carry as people of color. Yeah, it really is. And just being able to walk in and know that you are enough, period, yeah. the end. The way you are inside, the way you are outside, you right. are enough. Just having that confidence yeah. is so important and not having to apologize. It just means so much. Yeah, exactly. Not having to teach, not having to educate, not having to you know, live this double consciousness and being, you know, walking on eggshells because you don't, you don't know what they are assuming about you. Uh-uh, all of that, you know, hopefully we can, we can come out of this without having to do as much of that as we have been before. Yeah, that, that would be some real change, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now we're gonna segue into our Q&A. Hi, Sydney Davis. Please ask your question. Okay. Um, all right. My question is, since I know there's quite a few people here that are also writers, what um, stories ha are either in history or did you pick up in the news or that you just know about that you feel would help to um, counteract what we're going through? What, are there some historical characters like, oh, if this story were told in a film or even told in a play, that would have an impact with this racial conversation? So that's my question. Hmm. Well, I'll okay. jump in. Okay, Julia, go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, I just have a, a, a you know, I want to make sure there's so many different worthy stories right now, and every story is worthy, right? Um, we're going through a lot of hurt right now, a lot of turmoil, a lot of insecurity. Um, what, one thing that I tried to do was write about that insecurity, and it was hard for me to write about the how, hurt, write about that hurt, rather. It was hard to write about that hurt unless I understood the hurt, unless I was able to deal with it, right? And I'm sure a, a lot of you have that same situation going on. So what, instead what I did was I focused on what was my end result? What was the, the love I wanted to see at the end, right? Um, when I saw what, George, what happened to George Floyd, it was something that all, all of us saw. We were all able to see this. And if it doesn't hit you in a way, I don't care what they said about him afterwards, right? If that doesn't hit you in a way where you understand that there's something wrong there's something you may not feel it's about race, but it, there is a there is a, an element of race in it that is a worthy topic to write about. If somebody says it's about race, then it's about race, right? It's worthy, but there's also more to it, uh, which is what I, I'm writing about now. Which I switched my story after I understood the hurt. I went from writing about race to now writing about violence violence is really because you have black police officers male and female that are doing some of the same things right so th is that about race only it's still about race but there's some other elements so there's it's like a tree branch that, I, that i'm realizing you know yeah there's race is here one of these leaves but then there's violence over here there's insecurity there's psycho this and that and so I just encourage you to un understand it first, understand what it means to you, and then write from that perspective. I wanted to give a perspective also, uh, piggybacking on what Dr. Hansen has said, is that um, we all need to tell our stories, no matter what. And our stories uh, reflect the human condition. I find that 
when I watch foreign films or things like that. I don't need to speak their language. Uh, I don't need to be part of their politics, but the day-to-day -day activities affects their daily lives. And uh, the concept of two steps forward and one step backwards, you know there's always going to be the step backwards. Whether we take the steps backwards ourselves or somebody's stepping on us to keep us down, to let that happen. So when we have the slings and arrows that pushes back, that that's dampens our creativity, we have to uh, be knowledgeable, of, acknowledge that, and then still move on. I think about um, uh, what happened recently with um, the sitcom uh, Blackish. They had an episode that was a while back two years ago that was suppressed by the networks. Uh, the episode was called Please Baby Please. I went and saw it because of the news and I went, oh my God, it is so timely now because they were talking simply of uh, singing a nursery uh, a song to the baby. And, but then it's all their perspectives of, of why race and racism comes into full play and the networks refused to play it for two years. And now they chose it to uncover it. And same goes on the flip side, on the Asian side, we were doing so well with Crazy Rich Asians. We did off the charts, uh, undescribable breakthroughs with um, Parasite, you know, a foreign film winning the Oscars, unbelievable. And, and in a second, in a New York second, and all of a sudden these uh, Asian racism, that things are happening all over the place. So in spite of those things happening, you know, you, to be able to acknowledge the progress that we have made and not to let those backward steps get us down and still move forward in spite of, you know, the, the, the lies and the, 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 the things that they would tell about you as a person, as an individual, uh, or things that happen our spirit as a race to let that hold us back. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, William Warren has a comment. William, please share your comment. Hi, uh, first of all, it's great to see all the wonderful faces here. And I'm so honored and pleased to be a part of this. Um, I just wanted to mention Tiffany, and actually part of what you were saying there, Peter, also, but Tiffany, you mentioned something that uh, I just wanted to let you know it, it, it resonated with me. Um, I always knew that I was an artist and um, came here to pursue myself, uh, to pursue being a better, the best artist that I could possibly be for myself. Um, through circumstances, I left the industry, left arts completely, and ended up going to corporate America. And for I was in corporate America for almost 35 years. And through this uh, pandemic and what happened with George Floyd, uh, over the past... I guess six months or so, I there's been this, I've been choked up from pain where I hadn't been able to really express myself the way I wanted to, where I, I knew I should or wanted to, but it just would not come out. And it was something that it started, um, I started thinking about it recently, and you, you struck the nerve, Tiffany, it was about how much of my energy that I had to spend on either proving someone wrong or dispelling some type of thoughts. I, I found myself just working so hard to do that, I, that I lost myself. I lost who I actually was as an artist. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you. 
uh, because uh, even though I have been in this discovery mode for a couple of years now of finding myself and my artistry, um, your your comments uh, are helping me in that back in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for you know for sharing that. Um, I don't know if there's an echo. That's that's why we're having this uh, conversation um, because you know like Julio said, you know all of us on this call is in, is in of itself a community, uh, a, a live spirit that's that's moving and. You know, like you said, you, you're in a place of discovery and all of these types of conversations just, you know, move you forward to, you know, the person that you, you're still becoming, that we're all still becoming and, and realizing it. Because once you, once you get a hold of the fact that, you know, you, you realize that's what you're doing and, you know, that it's taken away from who you are, and then, and then you, you, you have to, you know, you have to figure out how, how can you, how can you change that so that you can, you know, move forward and spend the rest of your time in your life being and doing who you are and the gifts that you were given, you know, to enjoy them, you know, and, and whatever anybody else thinks from what I've learned, they're going to, they're going to think that regardless, you know, exactly. They're, they're never, if, if they want to believe that, you know, all the teaching, all the talking, you know, correctly and speaking and saying and doing the right things is never going to change them, you know. And so we might as well get busy doing what it is we want to do, you know. Absolutely. Calvin, you had a question? Yes, I do have a question. You all have shared some um, great uh, insight and this is a great conversation. So my question is, how do we take all of this information and channel it into the importance of voting uh, and also um, making the right decisions and, and researching so that we can actually elect the the officials and 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 the appropriate people that we think that would align with what we believe in and what we're fighting for. Excellent. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I I have a lot of concern uh, about this area because I'm hoping that um, the 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 party the um, the Democratic Party, um, once again, not to offend anyone, but I'm um, hoping that they have a strategy in place to um, mo motivate, you know, the base. You know, we don't know if it's going to come down to mail-in ballots, mailing ahead of time, or people actually going to the polls. Um, so, you know, the, the, the mailing in the ballot ahead of time kind of worries me um, because, we are so used to just relying on the actual polls. And then from what we've been told, they've been doing a lot of, a lot of systematic things to remove that, those opportunities for people. And then an overall big picture is that I, I feel that we need to, to really focus on trying to um, re-educate or, or get people to be excited about voting, not just for the presidential campaign because um, we, as what happened with Barack, we came out in numbers and we voted for him. And then when it was time to vote for the Senate, nobody, no one showed up. And so we ended up with the, a House of Congress that was uh, majority uh, Republican and he, his hands were tied for the eight years that he was in office. And so somehow we've got to figure out how to make uh, voting on a regular occurrence, not just in the presidential um, vote, but throughout the year, a constant that we do and not have this kind of apathetic, you know, uh, kind of behavior to it, almost to the degree that Biden had to, you know, choose 
they were saying he had to, cho to choose an, an African-American woman just so that we would go out and vote. And while I'm happy that he did, it shouldn't be that way. You know, it shouldn't be that we're only going to want to go out and vote, um, especially when people die for us to have the right to vote when there's an African-American candidate. So... Exactly. You're exactly right, Tiffany. And I encourage the playwrights. This just came to me. You know, perhaps if people actually saw how important their vote is, that maybe it would speak to them. Because I, I know, and this is just a brief aside, Tiffany, you know, I stood in line for that, to vote for Barack Obama. And then when I, it was like two hours I stood in, but I was determined I was going to stand in that line. And then when I went back home, one of my neighbors, I said, hey, did you go vote? And he said, no. And I said, well, well why not? He said, oh, my vote, it, it doesn't matter. It's, 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 it's just my one. And I said, but the, so many people think that way. And actually, it really does matter. So maybe if, and unfortunately, it was African American. Um, mm -hmm which is the travesty because there are a lot of us who feel like we don't have to vote. We don't have to uh, be in the census. You know, we're absolutely more than 12 to 13% of the population, but we're not counted because we don't do our due diligence. We don't vote. We don't do the census. So I'm, I'm just challenging and asking some of the playwrights, Dr. Hansen, to possibly, you know, write something that shows that hits home how important that is. And it just goes back for, everyone believing and understanding that you are enough. Your vote matters, your voice matters, you are enough. So and you know what? Um, and it's funny you mentioned that because I hadn't thought, and good question, Calvin, I hadn't thought about that being something we as artists could even have, you know, that monumental effect on until yesterday. I have a good friend of mine, his name is Nolan Williams. He's a great, great composer and a great director and a great uh, musician. And he said that he's releasing today a, votum, a voting anthem. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I got to hear this, what this sounds like. And I, I never thought that that was something that didn't occur to me. And it just yesterday he said, I'm releasing it tomorrow. So hopefully, if you remember his name, Nolan Williams, maybe Google Perfect. it. It's a voting anthem he's releasing today. And he's a wonderful African-American composer that just happens to be African-American, but he's amazing. Okay, so... We'll see what happens. Okay, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Thank you for your question. We have our next question is from Alan Shea. Yes, Alan? how are you today? Oh, fine, thank you, Alan. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear good, you perfectly. Good. Thank you. I'd like to, first of all, congratulate everyone uh, who's part of this discussion because I think this is the beginning. Uh, my background is I'm a commissioner uh, here in the city of Pasadena overseeing the Northwest area of Pasadena, which is the highly concentrated black area, uh, people of color, and where most of the shooting, the police brutality, and all of those elements uh, take place in our city. And uh, what I've done to try and contribute so that the next generation could really pick up the momentum is first of all, start out with a sustainable plan of action. Okay. The reason I try and encourage that is because I'm a, a child of the civil rights movement and the benefits that that brought forth. But somewhere in our development, my, my generation, we didn't seem to have an effective way to make sure that we continue to foster um, an awareness to where it, it captured numbers. If we don't get numbers, as you said before, even if, if opportunities come, we don't have the numbers to overcome the struggle. And that's why we're seeing the civil unrest we're seeing now. So in listening to the panel that you put together, I commend you, but I think the real focus has to be on development, sustainable models. That is why, and I'll leave this as my last statement to your great panel, that's why minorities do not have generational wealth is because we cannot bring about sustainable methods to, for, for African-American people to believe in and to apply it. It's not just about financial, it's about mental, it's about health, and it's about sustaining communities so that when we go through our economical channels or cycles, we're not taken out. You're absolutely right. 
Yep. You're absolutely, absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Hello, Roby Theater family. Hello. Hi. I just want to say I, too, am a product of the civil rights movement. I've been around a long time. And there's something that we as artists have, and that is the ability to tell stories, to take words from the paper and give them life. Because of the unrest, because of the social injustice, we have something that we can do that nobody else can do. Every time you deal with someone who has a racist statement, a racist action, a racist way of thinking, if you do like Cecil Murray says, take a moment, talk to that individual, so the next time they deal with someone of color, doesn't matter the color, of color, they deal with them better. Because if you take a group of children and let them play in nursery school, they don't know racism. Racism is a learned behavior. So if we take advantage of now, we have all the young people that got out there and demonstrated for Black Lives Matter, and it is wonderful. But as artists, as playwrights, I've been in three readings these past two months. The people from the South are writing plays, and we're doing them virtually, that are talking about Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. I was one in one just on Monday that was on Facebook Live. It's very important that every one of us individually, when we have the opportunity to deal with a human being, uh, the person who doesn't agree with what we think, Black Lives Matter, Asian Lives Matter, LGB Lives Matter, take a moment so that the next time they deal with someone, they deal with them in a kinder way nicer way. That's the only way the humanity is going to come through. See, uh, see, Bernard Jackson said that art at the Inner City Cultural Center. Hi, Peter. It's good to see you again. Art is the only weapon we have to save mankind. So us artists, let's use that art to save mankind, even if it's only one person at a time. Peace and blessings, all. Love you. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Um, Jason. Jason, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, everybody. Uh, but yeah, uh, I have a question. Um, and, and I spoke with Ben a little bit about this. Uh, so just to kind of give a little bit of depth on this. Ben was pretty much, and I don't know if you, I, I, I came in late, so I don't know if you guys talked about this, about the platforms. I know this is one of the topics for the day, but Ben and I talked about how basically the year uh, is almost pretty much a wash for Roby Theater Company as far as anybody coming in the building and watching any productions. But how does Roby feel about uh, putting together some virtual productions, uh, some type of high quality virtual production uh, where we can kind of still, I mean, the stage is still there. The space is still open. And um, I think this is an interesting space right now that we're in where we're able to reach everyone right now from their home and with these messages that everybody's, uh, you know, um, I think this is a very exclusive place where we can bring the theater to to people's homes. And I was wondering, you know, has uh, Roby wrap their mind around that and, and how can we help to do that? Because I, as I'm listening to everyone on the call, uh, we all agree that it's, it's pretty much in the artist and you know the theater's hands for us to uh, collaborate and find a way to continue to get these productions, these shows, these yeah. these yeah. images, this this whole uh, this whole experience out to people uh, because it's it's an art form that should not die as we progress with the uh, new technology. So that's my question. Um, if anybody wants to attack that, Ben or anyone else? That sounds like a Ben question. <laughs> yes, that is definitely a Ben question. I can, as a board member, I can tell you that some of those things are in the works, um, but I will defer to Ben to answer that question. Ben, are you able to answer? Yeah, you know, the answer is a simple one. It's yes, of course. You know, uh, 
after that, it's always in the doing of it. You know, we're actors and actors do. And a question like that to build that arm of a theater company where we do that kind of work and to bring it home to a level where it meets our hopeful standards that we are always working towards just a superlative standard of work that, well, every now and then we hit that mark every now and then after 25 years, uh, but often not, but the attempt is worthy in itself. It's an attempt at perfection, an attempt at at beauty and at the attempt at truth and all of those more or less highfalutin things. <laughs> but to build that is a big job. And it takes a collaboration, which I'm happy to see, by the way. I see there's Matthew Lee, he's in Atlanta. I haven't seen you in, in how are you doing, bro? And there's so many faces here. I don't see enough of Brother Dwayne, who's contributed so highly to the Roby Theater Company, and so many other faces and people here that have really made Roby Theater Company what it is today after 25 years. So a shout out to all of you. Thank you once again. Appreciate you a lot. And as we move forward, and we are working on that, Jason, and as, we, as you said, we've been talking about that. And to put things in place like this Zoom meeting, this Zoom conversation, put things in place in a way where we can strategize and we can do it. So I'll leave it there because we're working on that. We're working on that. And the resources, well, it's good to have resources. <laughs> It's good to have resources. Resources allow you to execute. And uh, that's coming. We've got a good team with uh, our, uh, our development team and our fundraising team and our content committee and the Playwrights Lab and artists like, I think Lee, Lee Simon is here. We're working on a commission piece. I'll go as far as to say, you know, the kind of work Theater. Theater is, is, is here. It's going to stay here. It always was, and it always will be, no matter what. We'll find a way because that is our way. That is what artists do. They create, and we will create a way to continue to do theater in a traditional way and build layers of work that are addressed and helped by this advanced technology that seems to advance every day. I'm trying to keep up with this. Yeah. Tremendous, all of this, all of this that's available to us. Just Zoom. Well, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir. Everyone's going through the same thing, trying to navigate all of this and navigate it under the umbrella of COVID and what we should be voting for come November. I'll leave yes. it there. Okay. Well, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Jason. And our final question is from Mr. Uriah Carr. And Ben, he is asking his question of you. Oh, hi. hey, Uriah, how are you? Uh, <clears throat> nice to see you, Ben, and everyone else. Uh, Jason's question was mine, so you can go on to another person. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, well, thank you. So uh, we're going to just say some final words from all of our guests. And Peter, do you want to just say just some final parting words? This is a closing remark, but I want to mention something that Mel Hampton had mentioned earlier, uh, and that is, you know, our individual struggles of um, making, putting ourselves forward. Um, I notice that sometimes what we also need to overcome is our own uh, prejudgments, our own prejudice, uh, uh, racial limitations, if you will. Uh, in America, 
we have a tendency to, in order for one person to win, another person must lose. That whole manifest destiny concept of, you know, uh, I have the, the innate uh, power to conquer other, other countries or suppress other people. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, the, the, the journey starts with ourselves. You know, it's like I have to overcome certain racial prejudice that I have myself uh, towards other, other races, uh, certain stereotypes that oh, oh, I, I have to overcome. And the other way around, instead of blaming uh, another person saying, okay, what can I do as an individual that's better that works within? I, it, I, I liken that closing statement, uh, as you mentioned, to what my life has become beyond my drawn to James Brown as a young man to dance the way I do uh, and, and be enhanced by that by the Nicholas brothers. I, it was not my destiny to, when I uh, was on the board of directors of Screen Actors Guild, when I shook hands with Brock Peters, he didn't let go and, uh, and we became uh, lifelong friends. Uh, up till you know the point he passed away, I remember a time when I took my mother to see a play, and they were completely sold out. And the person right in front of me was Stevie Wonder, and and he overheard the fact that uh, that we couldn't get a ticket. And he said, "Do you need, do you need a ticket?" And he gave my mother and I their tickets. He goes, "That's okay. I saw it already anyway." And it, it's just these things. That happened to my life. The other, another one, I, I happened to want to pay tribute to Sammy Davis Jr. when he passed away. I went to the, uh, the, the cemetery and it was just packed with people and we couldn't get in. And I was right up to the door because I snuck in the, the limousine section. And when I got to the door, they said, you don't have a pass. You're not coming in. So I just stood there and this one guy behind the door said, you want to come in? And all these other people said, uh, yeah, I want to come in. I said, no, I chose you and all the other people and he was a black man and he gave me his ticket and all the other people around me were black and I'm going why me and it's because it was destined to be so sometimes fate has brought me to a place of enlightenment not my own ability to to figure things out so my life has been enriched blessed and enhanced by having people of color in my life, and that's just my blessing. So I think all of that and move it forward, pay it forward, if you will. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Dr. Julio, do you have any closing remarks for us? Just want to say that I'm humbled by what I've heard here this evening. Uh, I'm no longer trying for perfection. I'm looking at more progression, learning um, from each and every one of my friends and family and people that I don't know, people that know more than me. I'm on a journey still. Um, so I'm humbled tonight. So thank you all for this. And I just happy birthday to my brother, my two daughters, all in August. So we're celebrating. <laughs> happy birthday. Thank happy you. Birthday. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Tiffany, you have any closing remarks for us? Uh, yeah, I just am um, glad that, you know, I was able to participate um, and this call and uh, learn so much from, from everybody um, and, and to be able to share, um, you know, what people are going through. Um, it's been um, really more than I expected of the evening. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm also humbled and, and just grateful to, to know that, you know, I'm able to connect with these, these people that I love, even though we're not together, but that the spirit that we have for Roby is uh, is very much alive, and uh, yeah, Ben, if you know if you want to do a production, I mean, you have a wide open rehearsal schedule because we, you know, we don't <laughs> we don't got no reason not to show up. So you know, <laughs> we're here. Just you know, <laughs> call us. <laughs> oh. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Tiffany. And Ben, do you have any closing remarks for, would you like to close everyone out? Yeah. Oh, uh, boy. It's, a, it's, it's uh, just humbling, you know. Um, it's just humbling to uh, hear all of this. And much of it is directed at the Roby Theater Company.
I'm out. And with that, thank you all. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Dr. Julio. Thank you, Tiffany. And thank you all for joining us today for this evening conversation with sponsored and provided by the Roby Theater Company and the Content Creators Committee of the Roby Theater Company.